I'm pleased to announce and introduce to all of you Hi'ile Covello. Hi'ile Covello was born in Kailua, Oahu, but credits her upbringing to her Covello Ching Ohana of Kahalu'u, Oahu. Her passion is Hawaii, our people, our practices, our land and sea. Hi'ile currently serves as the executive director of Paipai Ohe'ia, a small nonprofit that cares for an 88-acre traditional Hawaiian fish pond in He'eia on the island of Oahu, which is opposite of our He'eia. Yeah, ours has surf, theirs doesn't. Um, she feels very fortunate to be employed by a nonprofit organization that allows her to effectuate others through her passion. Her practice is that of a wahine lawea, a fisherwoman, uh, specific to the Kane Ohe Bay area, her family's dependence on the bay for sustenance has led her to where she is today. A graduate of Punahou School, Hi'ile received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Zoology and a Certificate in Marine Options Program from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She worked at the Oceanic Institute for five years in the Fisheries and Environmental Sciences Program, Stock Enhancement Program. Hi'ile left um, OI because of exciting momentum and opportunities to engage the community through the fish pond, which then led her to the creation of the nonprofit, which is now called Pai Pai Ohe'ia in 2001. So it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce you all to our friend Hi'ile Cavello. Might as well do this one, just to calm my jitters, maybe. Mai ka hale o mehe anula e, iulu o ka hau ilu a mo ola e, kau o ma eli eli no ho na aku e, kuhi kuhi o ke alohi ka moku moku la e. Moku kapu ke ke pai ka e hukai Ka hia kalupei ki a i mauai Pa o mololani malauka Pa aina po haku i pihinei E a mako o pai pai o he eia E leo aloha no ke ia aina nei Aloha Okay, that was not a performance, by the way. That was uh, just to set the tone for the evening. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that and explain a little bit about um, what that's all about um, after I talk about myself and some of my upbringing and what's led me to um, my current day profession and passion and lifestyle, which is that of a, a fish pond practitioner. Um, so a little bit of uh, general information. Mahi'a um, is the term that we refer to as um, a fish cultivator, someone that cultivates fish, an aquaculturalist, traditional aquaculturalist. Um, and we also have word, another word like mahi'ai, right, which is, your, which is your farmer. So we also, so we have the mahi'ai, the, the folks that grow the food on land, and we also have the mahi'a, the folks that grow the food in the ocean. Um, now talk about uh, the revitalization of the fish pond practitioner and um, I kind of consider myself to be that and that is sort of what I hope to impart on others um, for the purpose of doing our kupuna proud and for the purpose of growing food. Yeah, we um, live on an island and our resources um, by no means are, are infinite and so I think um, making use of our Fish ponds that um, in some cases are very old, like Hei'ia fish pond is 800 years old. Some are even older that date back to about 1,200 years old. Some are relatively re recent introductions. Um, some ponds in our area are about 200 to 300 years old. But nonetheless, I think there's extreme um, amount of value and ike to be learned um, through the restoration of ponds such as these for the purpose of growing food, yeah. Um, I think something that differentiates our organization from others out there is that we're very adamant that we're not doing this um, to make ourselves feel good, even though it really does make us feel good, but 
it's more so um, we're doing it for purpose, yeah, and the purpose is the same purpose that our kupuna had when they constructed ponds such as these, and it's really quite simple, um, and the purpose is food. Um, my ohana, we'll talk about that, but my name is Hi'ile Cavello, and I guess I should maybe talk a little bit about uh, my great-great-grandfather was born in some area down the, down the way in South Kona, the specific location I do not know, um, in 1851. And my great-grandfather was born um, in Kohala um, in the area called Halava. I think that's an actual Ahupua'a down that side. So um, even though I very much identify with, with Kahalu'u and, and Kani Ohebe, and the Ko'olau Poko Moku of, um, of Oahu. I definitely have connections here um, and other connections that take our Ohana's um, roots back to the island of Kauai. So mahalo for having me, and here we go. So um, I come from uh, an ili in Kahalu'u called Pakole. Um, to put it into I guess perspective, Heiakea Small Boat Harbor is here, and then the hygienic store is here. And then right smack dab in the middle is the Ili of Pakole. Um, there used to be a very small fish pond right, right in the, the um, nook of Pakole there, and um, that was called Pokole Fish Pond. So could be Pakole, could be Pokole, uh, but um, we grew up right on the water, um, and all of our resources um, that, we, that we eat at family festivities, they all came from the ocean. Um, probably close to 90% of the things we eat um, during family parties all come from the resources of our area. So consider myself very fortunate to um, have been brought up in this area of Pakole. That uh, top of the mountain there is um, called Ma Eli Eli. We'll talk about Ma Eli Eli in a little bit. Um, so the point of me introducing my place is that my place very much dictates my practice. And yes, I am a Wahine Lava'i'a, um, but specifically um, very different, I think, our Aina is from, from the Aina here uh, in Kona and, and Keoho and Kahalu'u areas. Um, we don't have a lot of um, pohaku. <laughs> uh, we're an older island, and so therefore we have a lot of um, very established reefs um, and extensive reef system within Kaneohebe, um, and also um, very shallow areas. So our primary mode of transportation when we go holo holo um, in our ohana, we call these things flat bottom boats. Um, they're they're created and intended to be able to go over very shallow papa. Um, without banging the reef or causing destruction. Um, and they're actually very wide in the back and narrow in the front um, yeah, to support weight and, and, and stabilization. Um, they're not made to go outside of the breakers. Yeah? So whenever I talk about resource gathering, I like shallow water. Yeah, I'm not, not going to dive down 200 feet, forget it. Not when you can catch feet in, one, in six inches of water. Oh, another one, yeah. I never, I never went faster than probably uh, eight miles, eight horsepower growing up. Um, when I turned, when I, when I uh, reached um, high school level, it was the first time I went on a, a speedboat, like a Boston Whaler, and I freaked out because, uh, oh, 25 miles, 25 horsepower motor is fast when, when you know. It took you, growing up, it took us from the central part of the bay, from my grandma's house all the way to Kualoa. It took us 45 minutes with one eight horsepower motor to get there. So, yeah, times have changed. So people plus place equals practice and the traditions, yeah? So um, I feel like I'm a reflection of my, my, um, my place. And um, if you know anything about this area, you know that Kanyohebe is very shallow and everybody comes over there to catch he'e. Yeah, so that is um, that practice and the practice of catching he'e um, is um, very specific to our area. Uh, pretty much every day throughout the year, weather dependent, um, we're, we're catching he'e, we're catching octopus. 
And, um, and so here's an olelo no eau that says he kai o he e ko kapapa, which basically says that kapapa, which is this island in the foreground, uh, possesses octopus spearing waters. Yeah, so it <clears throat> tells you a lot about the area. Um, also want to mention that Kapapa is this island here, and in the, in, far off in the distance, we have um, what we refer to as the Kualoa mountain range. Um, the older name, actually the ridge line is called Mokukapuoha Loa, and the highest point of Mokukapuoha Loa is um, Kanehualani. Um, and so I was taught by my ohana and my kupuna that Kanehualani serves as the cool stone for the entire bay uh, of Kaneohe Bay and Kapapa serves as the Hina stone, um, kind of signifying that the area is very productive and that is a place of, a place of fishing and gathering. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that later on. So this is kind of the norm for us. Um, which is very different, which is why it's up here in the slideshow. It's very different from this area here. Um, these are all called patch reefs, or poimoku, or poi poi, or what we call them. And um, so I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, but Kanyohe Bay, an older name for the bay, um, we found a, a name called Kawahao Kamano, which refers to um, Kawaha, the mouth of a mano shark. Yeah, and if um, you're a seafaring person and, and are accustomed with the waters in that area, you know that as soon as you enter, um, you come around the point actually from Kailua, um, you'll see Kawahao Kamano, yeah? Um, sort of the Ko'olau mountain peaks serve as the niho of that mano. And so you are in fact entering the mouth of the shark. Also, it's very difficult to navigate, so, um, so you had to know where you're going, and you still have to know where you're going. Um, but our bay is littered with, with reef, and that will come into play when we talk about the loko i'a, these types of reefs. We also have two miles offshore, uh, a barrier reef. Um, that, that's where we receive all of our nalu. So we're lucky in that the bay is mostly, for the most part, protected from any kind of wave action, which differs from you know this shoreline and loko i'a that were built um, in this area. Um, and then closer to shore, and the fish pond is built upon uh, um, a fringing reef. Um, our fringing reef's name is Malauka'a, um, but the fringing reef, it, it grows a little different than, than uh, patch reefs do and barrier reefs do. Um, it grows away from the aina, so we call it fringing reef, and I always have to explain this to kids, right? So I tell them, you know, with the fringe of a skirt. I say, but oh, but Auntie Hiile doesn't wear skirts, yeah? So I don't really know what I'm talking about, but you, you catch my drift. Anyway, so it grows away from the aina, like the fringe of the skirt. So speaking of practice and practice being very specific to place, um, when we talk about he'e and catching he'e, there's many different ways to catch he'e. You guys probably maybe on this side, maybe you dive for he'e, lu'ukae, or maybe, I don't know if you guys make use of lu'he'e here. Um, for us, because it's so shallow, we don't use luhe'e. That's not something that our ohana practiced. But um, we do dive when the weather is not conducive to this practice here. And this is called okilohe. Well, the individual, my dad on the front of the, the bow of the boat, is, is called the okilo. So the okilohe'e. And then the method of fishing is called ko'oko'o. Yeah, we all know what a ko'oko'o is, a, a cane, a stick. Um, but ko'oko'o meaning to poke yourself along. Um, so our pigeon that we use to refer to this type of fishing is called poke stick. Um, so you can poke stick, you can poke stick to catch he'e, you can poke stick at night with a lantern on the bow of the boat to, to throw net for, for anai, for mullet. Um, what else do we use poke stick for? That's pretty much it. Um, but yeah. So the idea being the water is glassy like this, real malia, the water is really shallow. And, um, and in those kinds of conditions, when the conditions are right, you can spot a he'e 50 feet to 100 feet off of the front of the boat without having to get wet. So I love this because I actually get really cold really quickly. So this is like my favorite because then I don't have to get wet. 
Um, and it's very challenging, so it's sort of like training for me. This is what you want to see. This is what you would see 50 to 100 feet um, off of the bow of the boat um, on a good day. You might catch an octopus like this that's sitting and sunning itself on top of its hole. Um, we refer to he'e as like different colors, so sometimes they're orange. This is orange. Sometimes they're red. Um, usually when the sun is stronger, they take on a red color. Sometimes um, if they live amongst uh, limukala, they actually stand up on top of their hole and sway back and forth like the limukala does. Um, sometimes they're in the hole and covered up with, with ko or pohaku rocks. And um, if you're familiar with the Hawaii urchin, um, that's a collector urchin. The collector urchin does that, puts the rocks on top of its head. But that, that's the type of, of um, what the he'e what the is mimicking is the Hawaii. Um, so it's kind of never the same, which is why I love to catch he'e. It's always different and very challenging. And then, of course, you catch them. We use a long spear, yeah, long spear, and then it's super heavy, so then you gotta get on the boat, and then you gotta knock it out and put it in the cooler so you don't have to wrestle with it. Yeah, that's a big one. So do you guys know about He'e? Might as well talk about He'e. You know about their life history? I could talk about He'e all day long. <laughs> um, they actually, and, and they, they're born, Right, they're born, they, s they drift out to sea and they come back and settle and sometimes you might see them really, really, really small, like you know, the s smaller than the size of my fist, crawling on all the ko'a um, and hiding in all the nooks and crannies and, and within a year, it can, repro it can get to be large enough, eight pounds, 10 pounds, even bigger sometimes, to then reproduce and if you're a wahine, um, a he'e, um, you lay your eggs and you tend to them in your hole and then the, the female, the female he'e die. Um, so they, they really only live one year and that's it. So it's kind of a sustainable practice um, as long as you, know, you can ensure that they've laid their eggs already. But the reason why the wahine he'e dies is because it's tending to its eggs in the hole. Yeah, it's constantly cleaning and blowing streams of water over it to clean the eggs um, until they hatch. And during that time, they don't feed, they don't forage, so their body, they get really weak and they have no energy and oftentimes they just die in the hole. So, I don't know, that was a little side distraction. I'm easily distracted, don't mind me. Okay, so... We fish for he'e most of the time. That's our family's mainstay. Um, it's also a form of uh, bartering for us. I don't know if that's the right word, bartering, exchange. Kokulauka, kokulakai. We have taro farmer friends that give us luau leaf and we, f we give them he'e or, or they grow the kalo and make us poi and then we give them he'e. So for us, it's a form of currency. Yeah, you get my drift but minus the money part of the equation. Um, there's different types of fishing that we do in the bay. Of course, pole fishing during the summer. We use heavy line, hand line during the summer. Trap fishing, winter and summer. We use throw net too, but you guys know throw net is not Hawaii. Yeah? It was an introduced practice that was adopted. Just <laughs> wanted to make that point. Luukai. And then um, we do a lot of um, crab net fishing. Okay, so that's the different types of fishing we do, but then we also catch different resources. And I thought I'd show them because I don't know, maybe some of them are slightly different than, than what you guys harvest here. Ama'ama ama or anai is um, abundant in the bay during the winter months. Um, right now they uh, just pow spawn, so they're all real skinny. So we don't catch them now because no sense you catch them because there's not much meat to them. Um, we let them fatten up just a little bit. Plenty manini, we get plenty kole, pualu, we get a lot of pualu. Our fish pond actually has a lot of pualu in it. We get vana during the winter. We eat a lot of veke, white veke primarily. That's a picture of red veke though. 
Um, during the summer, we get an influx of, of papio and ava'awa. Ava'awa is the, the, the skinny silverfish underneath the papio um, because they're schooling in the bay. They form, they form uh, feeding aggregations in the bay. And then kupe'e, same like all you guys probably over here. And then uh, kupopo. Kupopo is a type of wrasse that lives in and amongst limukala and limulipoa. Um, and limu alani, and during the winter months, uh, we go and we use small little hand line and we hook them, and um, and that's really ono fish fried. What fish is in ono fried? <laughs> uh, but here's another ole, ole no eau, um that refers to our area of of koolau poko and kawahau kamano, and that's kai a vale nui o ke koolau ya. Kai a vale nui vale vale is the slime. So slime that the he'e exudes, um, especially when you pound it. That's one of the reasons why you have to salt and pound he'e, is to get rid of the slime. It's also a means of tenderizing. And so talking about um, the resource of our area, which is, which is the he'e. And then we have he'e ya. <laughs> um, this is an old photograph that was taken of Heia fish pond, kind of from the flanks of Pu'uma Eli Eli looking east. And uh, it was taken in 1910. And take a look at it because it shows that um, at each makaha, um, there are hale kia'i. And I'll reference this picture later on in my talk. But um, this is a, a quote that uh, Samuel Manayakalani Kamakau um, said, and he said, Ona loko ia oia oia na me ho o hilu hilo ka aina au kapa ia he aina momona yeah so fish ponds uh, were things that beautified the land yeah and a land with many fish ponds was considered to be a fat land and fat is not a bad thing yeah especially um because if you momona or you know if you have a little bit of love handles on you um then you're well fed, yeah? And, and to be well fed means that there's ample resource to feed you. Um, or you have a really good kane to take care of you. <laughs> okay. This number 400 reflects the number of fish ponds that were in existence at the turn of the century. So as recent as the early 1900s, there were still 400 fish ponds that were around, some big, some very small, like an acre. Um, and all of them were producing fish. So this is a harsh number, um, but it was for another presentation, and I was trying to make a point. <laughs> and the point is that um, of those 400 fish ponds, we have maybe, if we're lucky, 40 uh, 40 still in existence. Um, of those 40, maybe there's a good mm, 15 to 20 of them that are undergoing restoration, active restoration and maintenance. And there's a presence at that lokoya um, working to, to take care of it. The other 20, um, they're still around. They're still in some level of preservation. There might be um, an entity that, that owns it. Uh, private landowner, for example, um, but maybe not, maybe not someone that is quite yet to the point where they're actively restoring it or wanting to grow fish. So the zero reflects that um, there's currently nobody that is um, using their fish pond to grow food, and zero fish ponds that are actually feeding the community in terms of actual food. And that's a little wrong because like our fish pond, we'll go and catch fish and we'll feed different kupuna and we'll use fish for curriculum purposes or we'll catch Samoan crab or something to mahalo, somebody that helped us out. So we are feeding the community, but not to the extent to which fish ponds um, have the potential to do so. Okay, um, so of the 400 fish ponds, there were 96 on the island of Oahu. Oahu had the most lokoia. And I like to say that, especially when we get plenty of Oahu people to, that come to, to visit us, right? Because it's important for them to see the aina in terms of, if fish ponds are a reflection of 
the health and wealth of the resource of that aina and that that aina was able to produce, then um, an island with 96 fish, pond must, m fish ponds must have been pretty awesome, yeah. Um, and must have had a lot of fresh water to sustain um, the creation of those 96 ponds. Um, so of the 96, there were 30 in Kaneohe Bay as recent as 1920, and now there's, now 19, not 1975, we're talking now, 2014. Um, now there's six, six that are left. And so it makes the case for why we do what we do, right? Um, but good to put into perspective because I think of all the islands, this island probably has the most lokoia that are still, still there. So that's a call out to you folks that, you know, um, I know there's a bunch of folks already working to restore lokoia on this island. That's so awesome, but we'd love to see so many more. Okay, here's a bad example. You guys familiar with Hawaii Kai? So this is a Kuapa fish pond, formerly known as Kuapa fish pond. It was the largest fish pond on the island of Oahu, 560 acres. Um, it was developed by Kaiser um, in the late 60s, early 70s. And now it looks like this. Um, and imagine how much fish and how much people this pond was able to feed, yeah? 560 acres. Um, so put into perspective, Costco Hawaii Kai is down Makai and Huinalu Canoe Club paddles down this side and, and yeah, Coco Marina. It's called Coco Marina now, yeah. So this is housing for, for um, the wealthy and, and a lot of folks keep their boats within the fish pond um, and have permanent slips there. But this is not where we want to go. Okay, so 1928, this is our Lokoi, uh, and you can see as recent as 1928, the fish pond is still in operation. It's still beautiful, no invasive plants growing along the fish pond wall. And Mauka of, of Heia, you have 400 acres of, of taro patch, yeah? Still being cultivated in taro. And there were about five poi mills, I, I believe, that serviced those 400 acres of taro. Yeah. This is, no, no, this is our pond. This is Heia, yeah, sorry. So this is where I work currently. And um, it very much does not look like this today. Anyway, so I did this in the beginning, yeah. Um, but it was sort of, yeah, it just came to me. I actually have a really hard time writing anything. And so when something comes to me that I'm kind of like, whoa, What's going on? Anyway, so I wrote this, and it's sort of uh, just a melee no aina of he'eia, talking about prominent places uh, that we see on a daily basis while working at he'eia fish pond. And the way that I wrote it is that it flows like how the wind circulates. So from where I am at he'eia, we go to Ma'eli Eli, and then we go to Kealohi, and then we go out to Kekepa, and then Mokapu, and then the wind blows back to us at Heia from the direction of Mololani. Um, so we'll talk about, we'll go through this, okay? So the first line, um, e komo i ka haleo meheanu. Meheanu is the name of our mo'owahine. Um, she um, takes, she's a kupu, a shapeshifter, so oftentimes uh, she would take the form of a beautiful woman, an elderly woman, primary form of a mo'o, giant lizard, not little gecko on your windowsill. Um, and then while in the fish pond, um, she, she's often seen as, as either um, a puhi uha, so a white puhi, or a, um, an anai, a big giant mullet fish. And um, one of her kinolau, is that of the hau, and this is a pua hau. And um, the story is that meheanu is present when the flowers are yellow and or the leaves are yellow. Um, and there's definite days where you look and the hau is all green, okay, she knows that. And then there's other days when you look and you be like, what's going on? And it's just all yellow and all the flowers are all are all yellowing, but 
This is um, Meheyanu. And she's known to be very fickle, um, meaning um, you're not going to really hear anything or see anything from her um, until you do something wrong. And then, um, and then you're going to get one slap or one pai. Yeah. Second line, kau o my eli eli noho na akua. Um, this is my eli eli, and I showed you a picture earlier that my eli eli sits right behind uh, where where my ohana is from, Pakole. Um, my eli eli noho na akua, the place where the akua noho are placed, sit. Um, my ohana tells many stories about different akua in the area, and. Um, all of them reference Ma Eli Eli as the place where all the action takes place. So there's, we have stories about Kane and Kanaloa up there, and, and um, there's stories about Hina, Hinaka Malama, and um, Hiiaka passes through this area. Um, in the story of Kiao Mele Mele, uh, Ma Eli Eli is an actual mo'o. Uh, but they don't know what happened to that mo'o. Kuhi kuhi o ke alohi i ka moku moku la e. Um, ke alohi is, is that peninsula you see off in, in the distance. Um, Kalai o ke alohi is, is its full name. And um, everything to the north of Kalai o ke alohi is, uh, is referred to as he'e ia kea. Everything this side of Kalai o ke alohi is he'e ia uli. Yeah. Kea, white, uli, dark, lush. Um, our ohana says that it refers to the resources of the land. Like a lot of people say, oh, kea, white, heaven. Oh, uli, dark, hell. Yeah, but, um, but no, um, it speaks to the resources of the land. So everything in, in he'eia kea is more um, sparse. Um, there's springs, but um, the aina there um, in he'eia kea is very much separated from the larger the larger area of Heeya, whereas Heeya Uli has five streams, you know, that merge into one and make its way down Makai by the fish pond. So there's a lot more Aina, there's a lot more water, um, a lot more um, verdantness. Kuhi uh, Kuhi is to point, yeah? So Kuhi Kuhi or Kealohi. So Kealohi is pointing to the Moku Moku. Moku Moku. Um, one of the sayings is ke koa moku moku o heeia, and it's talking about koa is coral. The way the coral grows uh, specifically in heeia, it grows moku moku style, which is patch there, patch there, patch there, patch there. Moku kapu ke kepa ika ehukai. So off in the distance, you have pu'u Hawaii loa. Pu'u Hawaii loa is on a peninsula called mokapu. Um, the longer version is Moku Kapu. Um, so Moku Kapu, yeah, tells you a lot about the land in that name. Um, a lot of burials for Ohana in Heeya and Kaneohe um, took place out there. Beautiful white sandy beach called Hele Loa. Um, and very easy to, to um, bury Ohana members in sand, yeah, as opposed to Pohaku or dirt. So, um, a lot of burials took place out there, but that little island in the foreground, or well, actually this big island here is Kapapa. That little island off in the distance is Kekepa. And Kekepa refers to a certain type of patch. You know, and you, I don't work with wood. You know, when you work with wood and you have the peva, the patches you see, there's a certain type of patch called a Kekepa that is um, kind of shaped like a crescent. And so when you, walk, when you go up to that island, um, you, you kind of cannot um, land on it because the aina is shaped like a mushroom cloud, goes like that, yeah? Um, because there's a lot of wave action, nalu, um, plenty huki huki in, in the water there that carves out um, the shape of, the shape of kekepa, and um, as well as mokapu. Whenever there's a north swell, um, you'll see the ehukai just covering that whole area. One of our um, one of our guardians of Heeia Fish Pond, is, his name is Lupe Kia Inui, and um, Kia'i is a guardian. Um, there's 
I put, uh, before I had a picture of a stingray on here, then I changed it to the hihi manu because it's kind of just a little bit prettier. Um, but depending on where you're from, what aina you, you're, you live on, you will, inter you will find oftentimes the in interchanging of lupe and hihi manu, yeah? Um, not to be confused with ha ha lua, which is our manta ray. Um, yeah, so, so I'm not quite for sure certain um, if Lupe Kia Inui, our guardian, um, was a spotted eagle ray or if he was a stingray. Both of them frequent our area a lot. So it could be both. I don't know. We can use all the help we can get, actually. So the story is that Lupe Kia Inui would patrol or he, he, he resides at Kekepa, that island um, shaped like the, the Kekepa Peva, um, resides out there and somebody was having a hard time with their pond, plenty poaching, people were stealing fish. And um, he called upon the forces of Lupe Kia Inui who lived out at Kekepa Island and Lupe Kia Inui responded with his entourage of Lupe and um, patrolled the wall. They swam back and forth, back and forth. If ever, uh, they would encounter someone that wanted to hana ino the pond, had ill intentions, wanted to steal fish, wanted to be sneaky. The lupe would whip his tail out of the water, strangle the guy around the neck, <laughs> poke him <laughs> in a jugular. Uh. You know, when I talk to kids, I go into like excruciating detail, right? <laughs> so they catch my message, which is, no come to our fish pond and make any kind and steal our fish. Um, so then the, the lupe would drag the body into the water out to a reef that's called Ko'amano. Ko'amano is a patch reef, a poi poi shaped reef. Um, drop off the body and then the mano, the sharks that live in the cave underneath Ko'amano would dispose of any remains. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what happens to you when you fool around with Lokoia. And then pa o mololani i malauka. So pa is like to blow, like the wind. Mololani is the name of our wind. It's also the name of our rain. It's also the name of our kai. Mololani for us is a directional, which is if you're facing the ocean from he'e a fish pond and you're looking east, northeast, out to mokapu, that direction is mololani. So anything that comes and originates from that direction is called mololani. Or Malauka'a, I Malauka'a, Tu Malauka'a, and this is Malauka'a, which is the fringing reef that um, our fish pond was built upon. Yeah, so Uncle Mahelani was asking about the coral. So you can see how it grows just on the edge of the reef. Everything behind that is all sand. Get some living coral here and there, but for the most part, the living coral is just on the edge of the reef. And then pa'aina pohaku i pihine, so we want to make strong the pohaku at pihi, yeah. Pihi is uh, one of the older names of, um, of our fish pond. Was seen on a mahele map. Um, the, ma the mahele awardee uh, was Abner Paki. And, um, and it identifies the lokoi'a as pihi lokoi'a. And um, pihi, if you look in the dictionary, it says it means fish or button. Um, and then when I talk to kids, because I talk to kids a lot, I tell them, where have you heard the word pihi before? And all of them say, and these are Oahu kids now, and they don't really eat o pihi. They all say, o pihi. <laughs> so they all recognize and identify the shape. So I say, okay, so good. That's what our fish pond um, name means, and it's in reference to the shape of the opihi, which is a depression, conical, with a fully encompassing rim that goes around it. And so our lokoia, the fish pond wall, was built in a full circle, which is unique. Um, one full circle, 1.3 miles in length, that's about 7,000 linear feet. Um, yeah, so that's kind of plenty. So we got job security, yeah. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> and then this is us. We've, we change faces all the time, except for me and Kelly. E. We're, we're always there, but this is our current staff. Um, 
differing uh, disciplines represented here. We have Hawaiian Studies graduates. We have um, educators. We have um, students of Hawaiian language. We have uh, business folks that went to school in business. We have um, brothers from Kauai that helped to build our walls. <laughs> and this is us today. Okay, so it's all about our place, yeah? And we love working here, and, um, and we've been around for a long time, and, and it's all good. I think for our staff, we take pride in knowing that, hey, you know, I went to college, I gra I'm a graduate, and I get to work at a fish pond. Yeah, so, so the, that is a proud profession, yeah, where others sit in an office and are not happy all the time. Why, why must you not be happy when you can do this, yeah? So some of our basic assumptions, so basic assumption meaning I'm gonna assume that this is what you, this is what you know I'm talking about, yeah, before I go forward, because this is like the basic for us, is that our fish pond comes first, which it basically equates to our kupuna come first. We answer to the place and we answer to our kupuna and that's it. Uh, sometimes we gotta answer to, you know, permitting and uh, governmental entities, but, but really we, only <laughs> we answer to the pond and our kupuna first. We are part of our ecosystem. We are not above it. Um, we are a part of it. And everything's interconnected and dependent on one another. We know that um, because that's how we're all going to exist on an island. Yeah. Sometimes we try really hard to behave like we live on the continental United States, but we don't. We live on an island, so we should start behaving like we do. Um, I give plenty scolding sometimes. I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but that's how I roll. And we're restoring our fish pond for, for practical use and for functional use, yeah? We're not restoring it for its hist... Well, yes, we are sort of restoring it for its historical value, but it's not like a Bishop Museum. You go over there, you have a beautiful pohaku kuiai, I don't know, on the shelf, and you can't touch it, right? There's places for things like that. Um, but we're lucky that our kupuna left us places like this that, that we get to touch every day. Um, we get to alter, yeah? A lot of times people think of, of these kinds of places as things that need to remain stagnant. But our people and our culture thrives um, when we can evolve, yeah? So, I'm, sp I'm supposed to be talking about uh, the practice of mahi. Uh, so committing to practice is, is difficult at times, but one of our challenges is that fish pond work is tidal, yeah? Um, you start work at eight, you end work at four, but the tide does what the tide does. And a lot of fish pond work can't be done during a high tide, and a lot of fish pond work can't be done during a low tide. So um, you work when the tide lets you work. So things like uh, low tide, we build wall, we cut mangrove. High tide, we push barge full of material, pohaku and coral, to our work site so that on the low tide, it's there ready for us to build. Um, you cannot drive a boat in a fish pond on a low tide, can't do it. Um, good to remove invasive algae from a fish pond on a low tide. And we all know that the moon controls our tides, so um, we must uh, know our lunar cycles, yeah, and, and be in tune with that. Fish ponds were built to grow herbivores, yes. Yeah, we all like to eat carnivorous fish, yeah, especially up and down the Kona coast. We go fishing for pelagics, like marlin and ono and mahi and ahi. And you guys, lucky you guys get to get that every day. But for, for lokoi, uh, fish ponds were constructed to grow herbivores. Mullet, small surgeon fish. You see manini in there, ava. Um, and, and, that's just what, and that's just what they did, yeah. Because herbivores were the type of fish that fed, fed the multitudes could feed the masses. You could grow thousands and thousands and thousands of mullet, or you could, you know, yeah, go during rough water and, and risk your life possibly to go offshore and catch a, a big marlin or an ahi. Um, up to you. But 
fish ponds grew herbivores, and we'll talk about that. The challenge for us is that really there's no book that you can read. Well, Hawaiians were not, we didn't have a written language, yeah, we had, we're an oral people. Um, we communicated through oral tradition, through chants that are left to us. So anyway, there's no book you can read that will tell you how to run your fish pond, let alone any fish pond for that matter. Um, so we've had to teach ourselves, yeah. Um, there are a couple of kupuna that are left that managed locally, uh, you know, 50 years ago, but actually a lot has changed in the last 50 years. Um, talking about environmental and ecological changes, um, not for the better, that then dictate how you're going to malama your lokoia and what you're gonna do and um, how you're gonna problem solve. We like that every lokoia is different and unique, yeah, because, because the more the merrier and the more unique we all are as a collective and in our individuality as, as Lokoya and Mahia, then the stronger we are as a, as a whole, yeah. And of course, we always pule and we always um, try to ho'omana our place and our practice um, every opportunity we can and, and trying to write chants about our place is challenging, but um, we figure that that's a, our contribution to um, to promote the practice and for the future uh, of fish pond work. These are our programs. We have three. Before, we used to have like six. It's so funny. Like, I just laugh because the folks that work for us now at, at, at the fish pond, they don't, they don't know what it was like in the beginning um, where we really didn't know what we were doing and we had different programs, uh, let alone run a nonprofit. And nonprofits business, it's not easy to do. But um, we had programs A, B, C, D, E, and F. Yeah. Um, now we're a little smarter, older and wiser. We have three programs. One is our restoration program, that's Kuho Kuapa. Second is our Kai Kamaha'o program, which is our education program. And third is our Aina Momona program, which is our community based economic development program, which is the program that seeks to think creatively about, um, I guess, how to make use of our lokoia, what to grow um, in a time where you can't just make the mullet grow and make them appear. You have to think creatively about, um, about what to do. This is restoration in 2005 when we first started to, um, to deconstruct and reconstruct our walls. We did a 100-foot section, so you can see the before and after. It's kind of funny, though, because we took the picture. The top one is on a high tide, and the bottom one is on a low tide. <laughs> but you can see all the trees, yeah. And that's only 100 feet, and we have 7,000 feet of wall. This is, um, this is what we do. This is what restoration looks like for us on a regular, on a regular day. And um, that olelo no eao heali ika aina he kawa ke kanaka speaks to kind of how we are in our practice, in our work. It's really we are, we are the servants and the aina is, is the ali. And like I said, we answer to our aina, we answer to our place. At the end of the day, um, if we didn't do a good job, then we can see it, yeah. <clears throat> and so there's no, there's no easy way about it. Uh, but it's slow going, but it's kind of the fun part of the job because in this work, you're deconstructing something that's 800 years old. You're touching pohaku that may have last been touched, I doubt it though, 800 years ago, but we're placed there with purpose and in intent by our kupuna. And you get to see, you know, you see all the inner workings of what they did and how they did it and why they did it that way and why they used this pohaku this way, why they used the ko'a this way. And you know, not all pohaku are created equal, yeah. Before we can do that kind of stuff, first we have to get rid of mangrove. I spoke yesterday in the Hilo area and I know folks in Puna, Kapoho and Pohoiki, they have mangrove down there and I don't want to get myself into trouble, but I don't like mangrove because it's uh, not native, it's not from here, and it doesn't jive with our ecosystem. Um, having said that, I acknowledge that mangrove, um, where it's native to, 
um, has a definite purpose and intent. I, I got, I was privileged to go to Palau where I saw um, mangrove in its native ecosystem. And there, there were 30 to 40 species of mangrove and they actually were pretty. Um, but here in Heia, we have three and they're not pretty. <laughs> um, mangrove was introduced by the Hawaii Sugar Growers Association to Oahu in 1920 for the purpose of mitigating sediment runoff. So imagine Ko'olaupoko is real rainy, yeah? Rains every day, kind of like Hilo, but maybe on a, take it down a notch. We, 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 we don't get rain like that, that bad, but Ko'olaupoko is pretty rainy. We're the windward side. And you know, our Aina, they tried very unsuccessfully with sugar. They tried very unsuccessfully with pineapple and also with rice. Um, and you know, those kinds of large scale industrial intensive agriculture leaves the Aina stripped and denuded. And then you get ko'olau poko rains and ino ko'olau that come down and go whoosh, and there goes all your lepo out to the sea, yeah? And so the sugar people, they planted mangrove um, to kind of take care of that issue and it did its job really well, but what we're left with, you know, 50 to 100 years later is, um, is something that we, ha we, we didn't quite prepare for. Um, I think on your island, um, you know, mangroves a little more well received than on our island. Um, we're like, we're like to the extreme. It is negatively affecting the water chemistry and sediment chemistry in the pond and in the near shore areas such that native limu cannot grow. So I'm telling you guys this so that maybe you'll be supportive of the people that are removing mangrove in those areas. Um, I don't support the use of herbicide. <laughs> it's not necessary. Um, for us, I mean, this is another example of, you know, backbreaking work. There's nothing easy about removing mangrove. It's slow growing. We remove about 300 feet of mangrove a year. We restore about 300 feet of wall a year. It's just, you gotta go slow by little by little and, and, and cut it down. And then it exposes the, the wall. Yeah, the kuapa, which is the fun part of the job. So before and after, this is about, our organization was formed in 2001, and in the beginning, we were real slow. We, we didn't have everything figured out. We didn't have chainsaws, we had machetes. Um, and they, we didn't have an agricultural burn permit to burn all of our biomass, so we had to actually go to the dump and take it away. But this is about, let's see, five, six years worth of restoration here. That's 1,500 feet of wall. And then this is, from that point forward, this is about, where we stay? It's like 2010, yeah? So the next five years. Uh, and that's taking us to the corner, which is, uh, is that my next slide? That's not my next slide, we'll show you that in a little while. But this is kind of what we're presented with, yeah? Mangroves, destructive properties, grows into the wall, loosens up the, the integrity of the pohaku in there. The pohaku fall down with the tidal changes and flooding pressures. You lose material over time, pohaku runs away, coral runs away, and then um, you're left with this, and you can see this is a pretty good high tide, and water is just ripping through the wall. That's not, you can't grow fish, you can't retain fish in a pond if your wall looks like this, okay? So we dismantle, we, we set the stones, the Makai wall, we set the, the stones on the, the Mauka facing wall, and then all of this is backfilled with coral. And traditionally, the coral that was used is the coral from, from Kawaho Kamano, which is Keko Amoku Moku, or Heeia, which you can see is the kind of browner coral. The real white glaring coral is the stuff that we have to purchase uh, from a quarry. That's this stuff here. That's kind of our process, you know. It's not exactly the same as it used to be, but we are still doing it all by hand. We don't use any mortar in the construction of our, of our kuapa. Um, it's all still basalt, it's all still koa. Little bit different properties with the coral that we use now than, than the traditional coral that was used. And then I made the joke yesterday that it's ADA compliant, because we put a finer surface of coral on top of this with sand so that if you have a wheelchair, we can we can get you we can get you out there. 
If you receive federal monies, you have to be ADA compliant. Did you know that? <laughs> anyway, that's the corner. We reached this a month ago. That's 3,500 feet of our wall. We're halfway done. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of exciting. But we still get plenty more for go. So now we're, we're working our way upstream. So to put into perspective, this is the Makai facing wall, and this is the section of wall that follows the river. So we got about 1,500 feet of work to go upstream and a lot of mangrove to clear, but um, we're excited about uh, the results of that because um, uh, I'll have to say these movie things. If you build it, you know the Field of Dreams movie, if you build it, he will come. You seen that movie, Field of Dreams? If you build it, he will come. Okay, so if you remove the mangrove, the he will come is the fish. So, <laughs> so that's the idea, yeah? If you take the time and do it right and do it slowly and involve your people in the process, involve the community and everything, it might not be the fastest way, but I will tell you, um, you'll start to see results and you'll start to see things happening and natural rhythms return to the way they should be. Um, and then you also get the buy-in from your community. Yeah, You get them invested in this hana. This is our big project that will be done in a year. Uncle Mahelani was asking about it. This is a, a puka that was created in our wall from a 1965 flood called the Kiapuka Flood. And um, happened in 65. It was very devastating for our area, for the Ko'olaupoko community. Um, it caused a big puka in our Mauka wall, a big puka in our Makai wall. Um, and then it rendered the fish pond inoperable, right? You cannot grow fish if you get one puka in your wall. So um, you hear all kinds of stories from the community, from the uncles that used to just drive their boat in and lay gill net. Yeah, because they could, because there was a puka. So um, we've been undergoing about four years of permitting, planning and permitting to fix this puka. And it's really no different than anything else we're, we've been doing, except that it's deeper, yeah, and will require more material. And none of the material here uh, is existing, so we have to bring in everything. Um, so there's permits associated with this work that um, we should hear back in two months, and in two months' time, we're gonna get the approval, and then in the next year, we're gonna be done with this. And this puka will be no longer. Um, and we're gonna install a makaha here to a, a gate. Something that we've started to do in the last three years is uh, we build wall at night. And that's something that we're committing, or, you know, evolving the practice, committing to practice is, is what it does is allows us to get a little bit more work done in a given year. Our low tides, you know, we're limited to low tides occurring during the day, um, only during the summer months, yeah, like now. Um, but during the winter months, our summer, uh, our winter months, the low tide occurs uh, at night. So during the winter, we could choose to not do any restoration work, or we could build wall at night. And so that's what we've been doing. And we get like maybe 15 to 20 nights of work. Um, in doing so. So it, it lets us kind of get a little bit more um, work done towards our, towards our goals by doing this. And it's kind of fun. It's different. It heightens um, different senses. Yeah. It causes you, forces you to be more cautious just because you're working in the dark. You see different kinds of activity at night, different kinds of fish uh, come around and that's kind of cool too. Yeah, and then the neighbors say, oh, it looks like you guys are having a party out there. Or it looks like bon dance, so. <laughs> so anyway. And then as we restore so much wall, eventually we get to a makaha. And Heia fish pond has six makaha. We have three that regulate saltwater input. And we have three along our stream that regulate the freshwater input. So we can kind of manage the balance uh, of the brackish water ecosystem. Um, and so we, we refurbish the makaha and then we install the gate. And the gate, you know, you can see the spacing of it um, always allows for small fish to enter the pond, 
always allows for water to move back and forth. In addition, it keeps the large fish from leaving the pond. So that's kind of how it works. And then to seal the deal of that particular makaha that was just restored, we reinstall a hale kia'i. And um, in the next month, we're going to build two more over the course of two days. So we got our work cut out for us. But for us, you know, even though mangrove is an invasive species, uh, we very much try to promote the use of invasives as a resource, as a means to alleviate the pressures on the native resource, right? Come from the island of Oahu, where our ohia does not grow like the ohia here. Um, it grows all wangers. And it's restricted just to the tippity tops of, of the, the kuahivi, yeah, to the top of the koolaus, to the top of the waianai. Um, so types of wood that we would use to build hale kia'i are, uh, you know, we would, I would pretty much cry if I used ohia to build a hale kia'i on the island of Oahu. And I definitely am not supportive of others taking from this island because there are people out there that do that. So we use mangrove because if you read about mangrove and you do research, you'll see that the people um, in the areas where mangroves native to, that's like their primary um, house timber and firewood. Yeah? So it's really strong. Also, the thatching that we use here, this is all lolu. Of course, before times it would have been pili, right? But now there's hardly any pili, especially on Oahu. Hello, we're the, like I said, we're the extreme example. Um, but a lot of people use lolu in landscaping. So we make use of the dry leaves um, from all the different landscape projects around, around Oahu um, as our thatch material. So this is our hale kia'i, and kia'i is again caretaker or guardian. And so sort of not until we install the hale kia'i do we actually see the fish come back. And such was the case with this particular makaha. Until we put the hale kia'i up, there was no fish were real sparse. Now you go there and you see a hole hole every day by the thousands. And you see pua ama there too by the hundreds. And so, yeah, I'm a big fan of biological indicators. We get all of our work done primarily through the support and volunteer labor. Oahu, that's a good thing about Oahu. There's a lot of schools on Oahu. There's a lot of colleges, there's a lot of teachers now that are requiring their students to do community service work, yeah, service learning. Um, if you ask me, I think that's just regular. Everybody should do that, right? But now we have to carve it out um, in the school and in the curriculum. But that's good. It's good to see. And every year, more and more schools um, start to come and, and, and commit that to their curriculum. And they come contribute, you know, however little or however much they're able to, but everybody contributes something. This is our Aina Momona program. This is our, like I said, our community-based economic development program. Moi, invasive limu, grassalaria, salicornia. You guys have this in Hilo. I don't know if it's in Kona. And then that is an introduced oyster called the Pacific oyster. So moi, we've done in the past, we've dabbled a bit in it. Um, was a little successful, but very uh, labor intensive and cost, um, costly for us. Moi are carnivores, which means they require a lot of feeding, a lot of input in order to produce, you know, one pound of fish. Um, and so currently we're trying to move away from growing carnivorous fish in our pond and looking towards growing herbivores, which is what our kupuna intended. So this is a cool schematic, and it basically just says, you know, down at the bottom of the food chain in the ocean, you have your primary producers, right? Things like primary meaning they go straight to the source. So limu, they harness the sun's energy to grow phytoplankton, they also grow from the sun, right? Phytoplankton is like little plankton stuff, but they're actually plants. That forms um, the foundation um, of food in, in the ocean. Yeah, so they're called primary producers. They're on the bottom. This, is, this side of the schematic represents herbivores. So an herbivore will eat directly from the primary producers, right? They eat the limu, they eat the phytoplankton, they eat the diatoms, such is the case with mullet and ava. 
and then we eat those fish. Goes straight to Kanaka. Okay? Whereas on the other side of the, the schematic, you have maybe zooplankton, like larval crabs, larval, larval lobsters, eating the limu, eating the diatoms, and then they get eaten by smaller fish, and they get, they get eaten by a little bit bigger fish, and then ultimately they get eaten by an ulua, and then we go catch the ulua or the ahi, and then we eat that. Yeah. So the idea being it, is that you conserve energy if you go this way. This way, way more uh, energy, um, uh, it consumes a lot more energy if you go this route. Yeah, and then this way, if you grow the limu, if you manage the ecosystem, the brackish water ecosystem, all the primary producers naturally occur there, and that's the food for your fish that you wanna grow. Okay, so that's what phytoplankton looks like. This is actually, it's called microphytobenthos. I love this word. I kind of really like my scientific words. And then I like to say I'm like microphytobenthos. So then I throw people off and they think that I'm like making, it, making up my words, but I'm not. It's actually, it actually comes from somewhere like the word nutrification. It's actually a word. Yeah. Anyway, this is like, these are like packets of diatoms. Yeah. And this is what mullet eats. So if you see mullet scouring on the bottom of the ocean, you know, or you see them sometimes on the surface going like this, they're eating diatoms. Um, when, the, when the day starts early in the morning, this is on the bottom of the ocean, yeah, on, on the sand, on the mud. As the water warms up, as the temperature warms up, um, those little things, they like burp, okay? Imagine, burp, 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 burp. Okay, they burp and then they rise to the surface, yeah, which is, that's when you see the mullet eating on the surface. Otherwise, you see the mullet eating on the bottom. So kind of cool, yeah? And then that's what it looks like under a microscope, yeah. And that's what we want to grow. So the life, the growth stage for this guy starts as a pua ama, yeah? So like this, pua ama, and then you get ama ama, Saw a bunch of ama ama outside. I don't know if they're ama ama or wo wo, but they're kind of big for wo wo. If that's wo wo, but could be. Um, and then they turn into anai. Yeah, and anai are the mature mullet. Yeah. And then there's our story about the anai holo, where the anai actually holo around the island of Oahu. And I think that would be a really cool project for some Hawaiian student to do. Why the anai holo? Anyway, I got all kind of crazy ideas like that, but kind of good fun. And then this is the other herbivore. This is ava, milkfish. Filipinos call it bangus. Chenos chenos is the scientific name. They get really big, yeah. You guys probably have seen them. They get big, big, like 30 pounds. Those are called kalamoho, yeah. So same like the mullet, you have different names for different stages of growth for that fish. Um, and they're, they're like, I call them the gentle giants because they're so huge and all they do is eat limu. They eat ele ele. This fish eats ele ele and it eats something that we have in the bay that's actually a plant that grows on the bottom of the bay and it has leaves that are shaped like this, bright green, and it's called halophila. I don't know the Hawaiian name. I bet you there is one, but um, that's what they eat. So gentle giants. And then currently we are doing work um, in our pond <laughs> with oysters. This is a collaboration between different fish ponds. So there's our pond, there's Moli'i fish pond, there's Kiavanui fish pond. Between us and Pacific Aquaculture Coastal Research Center, um, that's over in Hilo, yeah, and it's a, I think a university facility there, but the researcher there, Maria Ha, is, um, she started um, giving us baby oysters, small little oysters the size of a grain of sand. And then we put them in the pond, and then they grow exponentially because they're filter feeders, right? So they're herbivores as well. Um, they aren't native, but for us in Kaneohe Bay, they've been naturalized in our bay since the early, uh, since the 20s. And so, you know, we have conversations about that, right? Are we okay with growing something that's not native? We definitely talk about it. But for us, we were okay with it because it's already naturalized. And then the way we grow it, we grow them in cages. Um, and they tumble around in there and they're not allowed to attach and then we harvest them and we eat them. Um, but it's pretty impressive. For, so from the size of a booger 
to the size of my hand, and those are the same oysters that you eat when you go to the, the supermarket, um, it takes eight, nine months. So that's like, that's like faster, that's the fastest growing herbivore, uh, well, in Hawaiian waters at least, if you ask me, because mullet, even though they're herbivores and they're real low maintenance and ava, they're real low maintenance, they take four years to get to maturity. Yeah, so that's the difference. I guess that's the, what you gotta think about growing an herbivore versus a carnivore. A carnivore will grow really fast, but require a lot more input, whereas an herbivore, you can kinda put them in and forget about them, and then, you know, four years later, you can eat them. And our educational program is our mainstay. We have kids at the fish pond every day, um, because what's the point, yeah, in doing what we do yeah, if we're not going to um, transfer that to the next generation and, and so on and so forth. They're the ones that are gonna take care of our fish pond after we pull. So we have um, a lot of just one-time school visits that come, uh, that come to, um, to visit the pond. And, and we also have other, other schools that make use of the pond on a weekly basis. This is actually their, their outdoor classroom and their laboratory where they receive science credit, math credit, whatever. So this charter school is uh, Halau Kumana, one of, one of our charter schools we work with. And, and um, the fun stuff really happens um, when you come to the fish pond more than once. Yeah? You can't just come one time. You're only gonna get surface information, the basic stuff. Um, when you can keep coming and continue to come and every week, then that's when you're really gonna get to do the fun stuff and really learn about the place. Uh, then I also teach a UH course um, at Manoa called uh, Malamalokoi'a. And this is my class this semester. And I really like teaching college age students. And then some of them, um, the real LA ones that really take to the work. Um, there's opportunities at the fish pond uh, to do internships. So many of our employees today um, came, they were students of mine at UH Manoa. They, they participated in our, in, in our internship for a year and then now they're, they're working for us. And those are Samoan crabs. Do you guys have those here? Mud crab, mang mangrove crab? No. They're ono. They're not native, but they're super ono. <laughs> That's, this is what I call, this is what I call guilt-free fishing. Yeah? Because they're invasive, you can just eat them. <laughs> and then we also partner with different, uh, you know, post-high institutions such as UH Manoa, SOS program, um, PACRC, over at UH Hilo, um, Hawaii Pacific University. There's kind of plenty, but, but it's good stuff because um, we have a whole laundry list of research priorities, um, questions that we would like to have answered that maybe we just don't have the skill set to, to answer ourselves or maybe we have an inclination as to what's happening and maybe we just need the evidence um, to support that, you know, so that our funders will fund us because sometimes they only listen to the graph, yeah? They don't just listen to me. Um, so you, sometimes you need that kinds of information. So it's good to have these collaborations and partnerships um, out there and we welcome, uh, you know, any, any kind of proposals from individuals but we vet it, we vet it, we vet them all um, amongst our staff. So if we don't feel that the research proposal or priorities align with our goals and missions of our organization, uh, we say no. And we have said no um, to others. And then, you know, it's not only about us and He'eia Fish Pond and Pai Pai He'eia. Like I said, we love it when we hear about other fish ponds that are succeeding or, or have the desire to start working on their pond and engage the community. And so, um, so this is our Hui Mala Malokoia. We first convened in 2004. Um, we had one year we were on uh, at Kalahui Pua, uh, 2006 we were on this island. Um, last year we were at Waipa. And this year coming up, um, we're going to be uh, in Hana. 
on Maui, site of the, the first fish pond ever built. So we're excited about going there. Um, but you know, it's, it's just good to be able to share, share you know, 15 years of knowledge about you know, working to restore a pond with others, um, kind of your, your trials and tribulations, um, successes and challenges, and, and um, so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Or, or they can take the information, whatever, use it or, or not. But um, we just get stoked when other people, um, when we can add to our hui, yeah. So currently there's about 30 lokoia represented in our hui malama lokoia, and every year um, um, we add at least one to five more. This year we have one, one fellow coming from uh, Waipio. His ohana owns a fish pond down there, so cool. And then, so this is kind of what it's all about, yeah, and I talk about the revitalization of the fish pond practitioner and our practice of mahi. Uh, and um, we've been around, or I've been at, at this particular lokoya for 15 years now. So I feel like I've put in a lot of time there and, and I've l learned quite a bit. Um, but this story, uh, this is a, a small little oli that, that we did, actually we wrote last week for our trip in anticipation of our trip to to Hana, and uh, we will be at the site of the first fish pond ever built um, at Lehoula, and it was built by uh, Kula, and um, and so we we are going to um, offer this offer this to to the place as a means to kind of acknowledge the place, but also acknowledge ourselves as as mahi, uh, and hopefully with our Leo, we then will. I guess, give us the power to continue on and be successful and allow others to be successful in, in this practice of mahiya. So, and there are many opportunities to participate I in our programs at Heia Fish Pond. You can check out our website. That's kind of like the one-stop shop. You can subscribe. If you go to our website, you can actually subscribe to receive our newsletters. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, if you guys are ever on Oahu and, and want to check us out, then give us a call. Call first. Yeah, don't just show up. We don't like <laughs> surprise visitors. Well, sometimes we do. It depends who you are. <laughs> Not all that bad. Uh, and that's it. So that's my contact information. Feel free to shoot me an email. Check out our website. Um, but mahalo nui to Kamehameha Schools to the Kipuka program, to the Sheraton um, here for having me and to some of my friends in the audience and to Kalei. And I promised that we would go out with a bang with this last Puana Kaike. So on the count of three, we will all say bang. <laughs> okay? One, two, kolu. Bang!